All right. Hello, everybody. We will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Abby. I am here at the Durham Museum. Um, welcome to day two of our uh, first annual Teachers Week. Um, so I started last night's workshop uh, the same way I'll start this one that um, we, as every organization is having to do right now, um, we had to look when we reopened at our fall events and decide, um, can we move forward with these? Um, do we need to adjust them? Do we need to cancel them? Um, and we uh, arrived at a decision for Teachers Night, um, which it will be our 17th annual, and we said, how about instead of canceling it, we find a way to do it really safely, and we actually make a whole week out of it. Um, and so I just want to give a, a lot of credit to the Durham team for thinking about it creatively, but also our planning committee. Um, so we did have a planning for a planning committee for this um, comprised of representatives from local school districts and um, also some nonprofits. Um, they are who helped us arrive at our panel uh, members and also at the uh, list of exhibitors that we invited for the in-person event on. Friday. So I'm very grateful for them. Thank you to all of you for um, signing on to participate. Um, and a huge thank you to our panelists. And I'll probably thank you two or three more times at the end of this because um, you all have been wonderful. So um, real quick, before we start with that, I do also, of course, want to thank our sponsors. Um, I believe all four of these sponsors have actually been supporting uh, Teachers Night as an event for several years, um, and they they did sign on to help us again this year with Teachers Week. So that is First Nebraska Credit Union, Metropolitan Utilities District, Metropolitan Community College, and the Nebraska State Education Association. So. For anyone watching um, tonight or that views this recording in the next couple days, if you are not signed up for our in-person event on Friday, we would love to have you. Um, a lot of those sponsors um, either are bringing that evening or have pre-dropped off some goodies and fun giveaways. Um, and we have lots of exhibitors. Um, very excited, uh, raffles planned, um, kind of all that fun stuff you know and love about our Teachers Night event, but um, in, a, in a safe way that we can do this year. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, last night was our COVID resources panel. We were joined by uh, Dr. Strong from UNMC um, and Bill Heaston from Completely Kids. We talked a lot about um, really kind of the mental health um, and self-care aspects of um, what educators, students, families are dealing with um, through the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, I know I heard a lot of things that resonated and were, were very helpful uh, resources. So tonight we're shifting gears um, a little bit, um, but one thing I'll point out is we talked about this last night. I am sure it will come up again. All three topics for the workshops that we're doing, um, they really overlap so much. So obviously we're having to uh, find virtual teaching resources because of the pandemic, uh, but the mental health aspect, um, the physical health aspect that comes with all of these topics. Um, and then of course, tomorrow night is our diversity, equity, and inclusion workshop. And we know that with virtual teaching um, during the pandemic, there are um, a lot of components of, um, of diversity and equity and inclusion that we'll, we'll need to discuss as well. So uh, with that, um, I am going to uh, take a look at our first question uh, here for the panelists. Um, I have uh, four questions, um, and then hopefully we have a few minutes for a short uh, discussion or to ask some questions, and then we will uh, conclude by 5.30 and ask the panelists to share kind of final thoughts before we do that. Um, so the first, <clears throat> the first question, excuse me, is I'm going to just have each panelist um, introduce themselves, um, their position and the organization they're with, um, but kind of with a nod to teaching virtually. Um, so I jokingly told them this was, why did we ask you to be on this panel? Um, <laughs> they're all very qualified, I promise. Um, so I'm just going to go in the order on my screen. Um, Andrew, would you mind starting? Absolutely, and thank you so much, Abby, for inviting us to have this opportunity to speak to our teachers. 
um, getting to collaborate about this and what's happening right now is really the answer to how we all work together and kind of lift each other up. So thank you very much for the Durham for inviting us here. Um, so my name is Andrew Brooks. I am a curriculum specialist at Omaha Burke High School. Uh, my role here is I oversee our social studies program, our fine and performing arts. I'm the director of our Air and Space Academy. But one of the biggest roles that I play here is I work through our marketing, but also in the allocation of our technology and trying to help our teachers learn how to use that technology to best fit their instructional needs in the classroom. Um, and I think you can imagine that in the time that we're in right now, that job is definitely something interesting. So I work with about 30 teachers that I supervise and then the rest of the whole building with doing whatever tech needs I possibly can. Um, so that's kind of my story and, and where I'm coming from. Awesome, how about Melissa? Hi, so I'm Melissa Cleaver and I'm with um, Common Sense um, Media or Common Sense Education. And I'm the Common Sense Education Manager for Nebraska and OPS, which kind of means that um, I provide professional learning opportunities for schools and districts, as well as supporting any kind of um, integration plans for digital citizenship, which now with 54,000 devices in students' hands in OPS, uh, digital citizenship is a pretty high um, need as well as as we're all trying to navigate that online space and helping you know get the skill sets that our kids need um, So that's kind of what my role is and if you're not familiar with common sense common sense is a nonprofit organization um, That's been dedicated to helping kids families thrive in today's um, complicate, complicated digital world and so we often are known for we say we rate we educate and we advocate and we have um, our ratings and reviews that have been around forever around media where you can check out you know movies online platforms we also have our education piece with our um, free curriculum that's research based and then we also have our advocacy piece which um, works um, at a national as well as state levels with um, advocating for laws and different things and policies to be changed to protect kids all right and last but not least we have tammy Hello everyone, my name is Tammy Loring. I'm with the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration, also known as the shorthand of CILC. Um, we're a not-for-profit located in North Mankato, Minnesota, and we kind of call ourselves the Match.com. Our job is to connect educators like yourself to cultural organizations from around the world to do interactive virtual learning programs, our virtual field trips. So to kind of give you a little bit of a background about myself, I started out doing virtual learning over 10 years ago at the Minnesota Historical Society as an informal educator presenting programs that way to teachers. Then after seven years of doing that, I kind of left it behind and went into the classroom as a preschool teacher. And then I was given the opportunity to be working at CILC where I I not only get to work with content providers like I did when I was one myself, but also work with teachers. And CILC is part of the Minnesota South Central Service Cooperative. It's a co-op of about 20 different schools that range anywhere from New Ulm to Mankato, Minnesota, our biggest school districts, to tiny little school districts with maybe 30 kids in their classroom. Um, and we help to provide support to them in many ways. So I've been um, starting this year with doing a lot of Zoom 101 classes, Google Meets, and kind of helping teachers get started to think about this year as virtual learning and supporting them. Wonderful, um, thank you all. Um, so uh, Melissa sent her information in the chat, which reminded me to remind you all, um, the educators watching, that if we, um, if you do have a, a question, comment, resource you wanna share, obviously use that chat feature. I'm guessing this is not anybody's first Zoom session, uh, so you probably knew that. Um, and then uh, also, um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, but we did have lots of folks who um, couldn't necessarily make it at this time, but we're definitely interested in the content. So um, we are uh, recording our, our panelists. Um, we will edit out any of the, the group discussion part um, as needed, but hopefully this can be a, be a resource for folks um, that weren't able to join us live. 
So um, that is a little bit about our three panelists. Um, we will jump into uh, the second question, um, which is I've asked each panelist to just tell us a little bit about um, what they are kind of seeing uh, currently in their community, I guess, or their realm. Um, what are you seeing currently in the virtual teaching world? And what are you seeing that's changing or having to change um, that we might uh, be able to kind of keep an eye on? And we can just go in the same order unless somebody else wants to jump in. Sure, absolutely. So one of the things, I think it's important to understand each situation is going to be different in each school district at each grade level. And um, as you get through each of those, I'm gonna help you understand the experience of our Omaha public school teachers at a high school. So that's gonna be very different than some of the experiences that you'll hear from our other panelists here. But I think it'll help to give you maybe a little bit of perspective. Um, the other piece that I'd like to talk to is my role as a father, because my daughter is at Marion High School here in Omaha, Nebraska, um, which is an all-girls Catholic school. And one of the things that she's dealing with is they're also half virtual, half on. And then my um, middle son and my youngest son are at a grade school here in Omaha, Nebraska. And they have a completely different experience and had a very different experience back in the spring when we first went into closure. So I've had this really interesting experience of all three of those different worlds. And having done that, I've had an opportunity to kind of see it from both the parent perspective, the student perspective, the teacher in the classroom, and from the administration. So that's kind of the context in which I'm speaking. But here at Burke High School, um, I figure we've kind of got three different uh, sort of teachers, if you want to think about it that way. We've got the teachers that are looking at what's happening right now and thriving. And they're doing it by keeping things pretty simple in their class, class periods, um, offering prompts to students that students find engaging, that they want to talk, that, they, that they're engaged to enough where they want to take their cameras and show themselves or at least unmute themselves and be able to participate in the class. And a lot of those are really thought provoking questions that the teachers are asking that are demanding the students to give answers and to think about it in this weird virtual environment that we're in. Um, Omaha Burke High School right now is in a 100% virtual environment. So we have no students in the building. Well, we, we just this last week, we added a few students, our ACP students and hearing impaired students, but we've been completely virtual up till now. Starting October 19th, we've got half the kids coming in for half the time. And the OPS schedule is a little complicated to explain right now with the way that it with the way that it's going to be functioning, but we're going to be transitioning from this fully virtual environment to a half and half environment. Um, and some of that is us looking at what other districts are doing and trying to learn from some of those pieces. So we've got those teachers that are thriving in this virtual environment. I have a feeling those teachers are going to be the same ones that thrive as we move forward into a three to two environment. On the opposite side, we have teachers that are really struggling with what's going on right now. Um, and a lot of it is they're working really hard. These are some of our best teachers that are really care about kids. They're working to do everything they possibly can. And there's just a lot of barriers with learning curves and things that you expect to be true that aren't in a learning environment. For instance, for many people, um, the second you ask a question to a class, it's a very subtle thing, but if I'm gonna ask a question, and I get no answer back. That moment for many people causes a great deal of anxiety. And when you build that up time after time after time after time again, that begins to really weigh on a lot of our teachers who are so used to that experience of their students. So there's psychological pieces um, in the virtual environment that, are, that some of our teachers are struggling with. And then I would say there's a third group of our teachers. So we got the ones that are really trying to figure it out, the ones that are succeeding widely, and then the kids, the, 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 the teachers in the middle who are trying to make it work. The best way to describe what's happening is we are just MacGyvering our way through this every single day. Um, a, a great example is we have a, a wonderful AP art teacher here named Brian Anderson, who was trying to figure out a way to be able to show his kids his drawing of something. So trying to draw in a virtual environment is a really, really challenging thing to do. So he ended up stacking up books on either side of his desk, having an iPad that had to be weighted on one side enough so that it didn't fall over became his camera looking down at a piece of paper underneath it so that he could draw 
and he's got three different devices all hooked up to his virtual meeting one that he's speaking into another one he so he can see the chats and a third one so that they can see what he's drawing so this gives you a, a concept of the amount of problem solving that is necessary in this environment and for those teachers that are willing to move forward with it um, they're really trying to figure things out and some of them have been really successful the the theme that i'd like to sort of bring through all of this is this idea of a growth mindset that I'll, I'd like to go back to as we continue with some of the questions. But if you've, I'm gonna put a book plug in here. Oh no, I can't share it on my screen. There it is. It's Carol Dweck's Mindset. If you guys haven't read this book, um, this particular book really defines what is happening right now with our teachers. Those that have shown a growth mindset are succeeding slash surviving and those that have a fixed mindset about what it is we're doing and how it has to happen are the ones that are running into the most stress and anxiety along the way. And I've seen that same exact story in uh, both of on all my kids' schools as well. The teachers that are trying their best with things that are asking for a lot of um, a lot asking for a lot of feedback from parents and students are the ones that are succeeding out there. And those that are shutting it down and saying, "Nope, you're only going to do it my way." because that's the way that I can control. Um, as soon as you get to that sort of a mindset, the, the stress and anxiety that you feel when it doesn't go that way is really weighing on a lot of our teachers. So from my perspective, from what I've been seeing, I'd say that the technology is gonna be what it is. There's a lot of problem solving going on, but the vast majority of what we're seeing is anxiety or for those teachers that are struggling with it, um, the anxiety and stress is is because they're trying to do this the way that they think it should be done and it's not working. So, and trying to adjust that course can be very difficult for a lot of people. So we've seen everywhere from up here all the way to down here along the way um, in, in our teaching, we've seen lots of people using um, really innovative software, um, doing a lot of flipped classroom materials, and then we've seen people succeeding with literally just putting a question in the chat and letting kids type in emojis. All of those things work. It, a lot of it is just, can we keep it simple, straightforward, uncomplicated, and communicate with the kids and get feedback back and keep that growth mindset. And we've seen a lot of success with those types of teachers. Thank you, Andrew. Go ahead, Melissa. So um, just to kind of echo that, absolutely from a national level, Common Sense, you know, has, you know, heard a lot of amazing things. We have a, a network of what we call our Common Sense Ambassadors, and we're hearing from them about the amazing resourcefulness of an innovation that teachers are, are doing. You know, that is one thing that we can count on with educators is that, and this absolute dedicated heroes, um, and very much an unsung hero. Um, and I'm also seeing a very lot of flexibility within um, our teaching use, you know. Um, but what is additionally being seen is, like mentioned, is that level of stress. And therefore, educators we know need to really ha know how to manage that. Um, and in our common sense uh, curriculum, we have our media balance, which kind of addresses that. And so not only is it important for the teachers to learn how to balance their own, but modeling that for our students because our students are also seeing that. Um, and I'm going to throw in the chat a resource that comes from Wide Open Schools, which Wide Open Schools was developed um, back in the spring when we hit our COVID situation. Uh, Common Sense partnered up with a variety of other organizations to, to create resources for teachers, parents, and students um, during um, COVID and, and during more of this increased online space. So um, there's some self-care information there. Uh, the other place that I get some really great information is that um, in our media balance curriculum, um, they have these family tip sheets and it's really good to kind of share those out. And, and that brings up the importance of like kind of uh, keeping that communication with our families as well about how to have that media balance, you know, because they are now this new partner with uh, us in education. Um, so that's some of the things that I'm seeing change. Um, and, you know, as far as our own selves, as far as helping create that media balance, maybe a couple tips that might help with that is um, just being aware of things like notifications on certain apps and, and things, you know, your settings and turning off to turn off at a certain time at night. You know, it's important for us as educators to unplug as well and get that downtime. 
And so creating that balance for us. Um, and another piece that might really help with um, this changing environment is just really looking at our digital workflow. Um, because we're now operating in this new environment. And, you know, as educators, we got it down in our classroom. And so now it's how do we adapt that into this online environment? And so that might mean uh, changing a few things. So one of the things that um, Common Sense has put together that could really be of help with that kind of digital workflow is how we're communicating with our students and families and really helping them understand when your availability is so you can really set up those media balances for yourself and giving them that information. So um, this summer, Common Sense also created their um, distance learning classroom guide for teacher or for families. And it's a template that you can use to really um, kind of set up success, being able to communicate with your parents as well as students, how you're going to be having that workflow work for you. And so again, that helps kind of protect your sanity, um, which we know as I was mentioned by, um, Andrew there that, you know, it, it's a constantly shifting and changing piece. The other part that I think is important for us to maybe look at is when we're talking about this teaching environment. Um, Common Sense did a recent quarterly report and it just came out a couple weeks ago and in it uh, was a survey with a bunch of students from across the nation and what we are finding <clears throat> is that over half or about half of our teens are saying that they are very or somewhat worried about losing connection with friends. There was like 56%. Um, missing out on extracurricular and on sports activities was about 53%. And then also a concern for our students are their losing of opportunities for scholarships at 52%. So why I bring all that up is as well as educators having this anxiety, our students are also having a sense of anxiety too. There's a lot of shifting and changing for them. And so it's important that you know, we remember that, that as much as we're paying anxiety, so are our students. So what can we do then in our classroom spaces is really help creating some authentic places for students to process these concerns in that online learning environment. And um, so some tips that I would recommend is like reviewing your lessons to see how balanced you have your balance from teacher talk to student talk. Because one thing we have to remember is students are losing the authentic space for that conversation and which is um, especially language development, because they don't have that lunch period to have conversations. They don't have that in the hallway period for those conversations. And so our online spaces might need to think about how are we setting up our classes to have some spaces that the students can have those authentic conversations. So if you want to dig into more of kind of some of that research that I mentioned, um, here's a link straight to that guide um, that has some of that statistics I just shared. Thank you. Um, awesome resources there. Um, and I, before we go to Tammy, I, I would add something interesting that came up in our uh, COVID panel last night. Dr. Strong from UNMC was talking about um, decision fatigue. And I actually played a clip of that in our uh, department meeting at work this morning because, yes, that decision fatigue is is definitely applicable to educators, but of course it's something we're all dealing with more. Um, and there's a lot of fascinating research about basically, I'm, I'm summarizing it very simply, but you, the more decisions you have to make, um, the more energy it takes you to make those decisions and the more you're kind of at risk for making um, maybe poor decisions um, or decisions you wouldn't normally make. And my department and I actually had a really interesting conversation about um, how we need, we want to keep that in mind as we consider our workflow because I'm a former classroom teacher as well and having now done a lot of virtual field trips and digital programming like this, the decisions you make, you're constantly making decisions as an educator when your kids are in front of you and you have that body language to go off of or you have that and so adding the layer of doing it virtually um, is, I, I I feel like it's it's double time on those decisions you're making, trying to adjust what you're doing. Um, and I'm saying that as a former classroom teacher who gets to do really pretty fun, um, <laughs> I hope, virtual field trips um, and content. Um, and so the the pressure of of having to make those decisions all day teaching virtually is is um, immense. And I thought that was a really interesting 
uh, thought from uh, her work in, in psychiatry. Um, Tammy, um, could you round out our first question, please? Sounds good. So I'll give you a little bit of a background of where I'm coming from when I answer, kind of just like Andrew did. Um, I work with schools in southern Minnesota, so about 20 uh, schools there, a variety of sizes, so that's one view I have. I am also first most a parent to, to two children in elementary, um, so I have that perspective. And then also um, with my current job at the CILC, I work with um, members from around the world. So I have the perspective of having many na um, distance learning colleagues who will give me a perspective for what it's like for their school in Kansas, all the way to New York, to California, and what they're going with. So um, as a parent and working with those individuals, in the spring, we saw a lot of it's bleeding crazy, let's just put the band-aid on and we're gonna get through three months and we're gonna hope that by that time there's a scab and we'll be ready to go and in the fall everything will be fine, we'll go back to normal, we don't have to worry about it. Well, in June, July, we discovered that the band-aid got ripped off and we're still bleeding profusely. And kind of people jumped into what I've seen into three groups. One was the really creative, thriving group that Andrew and Melissa were talking about, those teachers that really found a way to make things work and took advantage, simplified it, and said, I'm gonna do what I can do and my students are foremost and we're gonna work it out. The schools also in those areas really had a plan, it felt like, cohesion, communication with their parents, um, communication with their teachers from us and created a plan. There was the other group that I was seeing which was, this is what I did in my physical classroom and they are taking those four cement walls and they are trying to put them in a circular virtual room and they are going to hit that peg and hit that peg until either one of the walls break and they squeeze it in with a triangle or they give up and leave it all together. And with many of those, I see communication of um, various degrees between the teachers itself now working um, together, all having their own different approaches, or the, the um, just straight kids saying, this is what we're going to do, you figure it out, this is our plan, this is what we came up with based on what we've seen other schools do with how that all plays out, I don't know, we'll figure it out when we get to it, and that's creating a lot of anxiety. And then thirdly, it's the, we're gonna go back to school, I'm seeing, um, with a lot of schools I'm working with, and we're going to live in the sense that that snow globe is not going to break and we're gonna keep on going in class and there is no plan to go virtual at any point. And if it isn't virtual, it's we'll figure that when we get to it without really communicating when they make that decision, um, what that means for the students at home and their parents, and what that means for the teacher in the classroom, so physically or at home now teaching virtually to students that are physically in the classroom. So that's what I'm seeing as the biggest three um, trends out there. Um, and I myself as a parent too with that. It's really interesting how um, what Tammy just said um, echoes. Um, it's not quite the same, but echoes what Andrew said. So I, um, you know, Tammy, so Tammy's with CILC, and that is where we as the Durham Museum, that's, we've worked with them for years um, to post um, our, our free, free virtual uh, field trip opportunities. Um, but I, I appreciated that I knew Tammy would be able to come in with a little bit more of the national perspective. I know she's just north of us in, in Minnesota, not too far away, but um, as she said, they work with, with schools all across the country. So my hope would be, if nothing else, that the, the responses to those questions and really all three of the virtual panels we're doing, um, I know I found it helpful just to be reminded that other people are experiencing the same frustrations or successes or, or whatever. Um, so thank you, Tammy, for that kind of uh, broader perspective as well. So um, going into the next question, um, 
I had when when this panel particularly uh, got together to plan the questions and kind of the content. Um, I know at one point Tammy, not being in Omaha, asked us, "So what are what is your school district doing?" And I said, "Which one?" Um, so of course the Omaha Metro, which a lot of you are signing on from, um, has lots of different school districts. Um, I actually just maybe a week or two before Tammy asked that had been asked that by the leader, the rest of the leadership team at the museum. And I was like, literally everybody has a slightly different plan. And so I typed up a little summary to send to the team because it was just we were trying to get a handle um, on that. Um, so I, I preface that because we talked about that in our planning of the content for this panel, which kind of led us um, to the next question, um, which is, uh, I'm going to ask uh, the panelists to kind of expand on the previous question. Um, what are we seeing um, as far as inequities in teaching virtually, either for teachers or students? So some of the topics we talked about were things like data issues, obviously connectivity, um, the uh, teaching pods that are popping up, digital literacy, language barriers. Um, we probably do not have nearly enough time to really cover this question, but I, I'm i gonna ask them to anyway. So, um, do you guys wanna keep going in the same order? <laughs> sure. Um, so, here at Burke High School, well, I'll, I mean, obviously, um, Abby, you're exactly right. There's no way we could possibly cover, certainly, how this is affecting all of the variety of different groups of students that we see um, in, a, in a very diverse building that we have here. We've got students from all walks of life here and it's affecting each of them very differently. I'd like to cover a couple things just really quickly. One of the things is here at Burke High, Sch High School, we have uh, the largest ACP program in um, the Omaha Public Schools. So those are uh, students with severe and profound disabilities. We also have a ton of hearing impaired students here. And uh, I've been working hand in hand with our, with our department head, Megan Towie here, to figure out how do we get those kids the same access or even access at all to the information because we can get them all the internet that they want, but trying to be able to somehow find systems for the interpreters to be able to interpret the language to them in real time without lag when you're online and virtual is a huge challenge. And for a, ver for a student who's struggling with hearing to be able to look here and then just slightly come over here and be able to follow along when, when it doesn't match up, really create some communication barriers for these students where they struggle really, really hard in, in a lot of different ways to try and just get basic communication happening through a computer. So I've been working with the hearing impaired students and our interpreters on trying to figure it out. And it ended up taking, very similar to anything else, you gotta MacGyver your way around it. We have three different devices going for our hearing impaired interpreters. And then each kid's got two different devices. And we had to somehow teach these hearing impaired students while virtual to be able to use both of those devices to see the interpreter in one and then having to like pin them. So all of our students have iPads now. Whoops, that was plugged in. Um, all of our students have iPads and I, there we go, like this one. And, um, but which is awesome. The problem with the iPads is there are some limitations with what you can see on them all at one time. And for our hearing impaired students, which is something that a hearing student doesn't really have to deal with on a regular basis, they can get social cues through audio communication. Though our students are not able to do that, they have to be able to see it. And when you can't see two things on the screen at once, it's completely lost to them. So we ended up MacGyvering some serious devices in order to make this sort of work. And it took hours and hours of planning. Um, and then it just ended up the district said, okay, we're gonna bring hearing impaired students back into the building. So they are one of the only groups back into our building right now that are going to those classes and it's helping a lot. The other piece that I'd like to talk to talk about what we ended up doing, um, and I just have to tout Omaha Public Schools for doing this is we had an egregious amount of students that do not have internet connection, reliable internet connection at home. And we were looking at a district of close to 60,000 students without the ability to learn virtually. And we can't bring 60,000 kids back into the building all at the same time. Um, our district is a little bit different than the rest in Nebraska. And just, we just have numbers that are much higher than others. 
So our district went out and literally got an iPad with a cell signal for every single student in the entire district. And that's an absolute game changer for us. Um, we've had to work through the rollouts and trying to figure it out how to get these in the hands of some students because not every student has transportation to get to our school to pick it up. So we've had our deans and our security personnel driving them out to kids' houses. We have 2,100 kids. I think this gives you a concept of the amount of, the amount of manpower that it takes just to get technology out to the kids. Um, but we've been driving them out to their houses. We've been staying late. We've probably had 10 or 12 nights, whereas an administrative team, we're staying here until 7 p.m. So kids can come pick up their materials and try and get access to them. And then on top of everything else, that's not even guaranteed they're going to be able to get it because um, we have some classes where we bought the textbooks back when we weren't even virtual, wasn't even a thing that existed in our head. And these textbooks don't always have online resources. And sometimes the students don't have an online resource that they can even go to. So teachers are having to maneuver around that and try and put pieces together and try and teach kids without the use of the textbooks or the online materials we've got. Um, and the students that, I think it goes without saying, students that struggle with those language barriers are, are English language learners are struggling in this environment as well. And um, we're trying really, really hard to make sure they're not left behind. So um, this is a really interesting question. Uh, you know, going back to that quarterly survey and asking some of the students some of the things that have come up um, from students in regards to equity. Um, a third of the students or teens had cited that access to the teacher was one of their major academic challenges. And I think that ties into both access because their own digital access or the teacher's access, especially back in COVID. And you know, when we're talking across the nation, and even here in Nebraska with some of our rural communities, just even having the ability to have that um, Wi-Fi access is just sometimes not even viable because they're in the middle of some place that doesn't even have it. So those are some of the things that um, have come up. The other thing in regards to um, the access is also that that unreliable service, you know, and, and yes, kudos totally to OPS for taking on the data plan, but it has been a major learning curve and a, an ongoing process to to make sure that um, neighborhoods have the right and, and I have to you know give it up for um, Teen Mobile who we partnered with in OPS where they are um, working very hard to put up new access points and do whatever they need to do so that they can get it uh, access to the kids so um, and it's been amazing to see the the tech companies across the nation really trying to do that I think um, has been pretty interesting to see as well um, some other things when we talk about digital equity is, you know, in some places um, we have like, according to that uh, survey that I posted earlier, 31% uh, of our teens are saying they're signing up for extra online classes in the year. Um, and 10% are hiring tutors, 13% are joining what we call school pods with other families. I haven't heard a lot of that here in Omaha as far as school pods being something, but what we um, are seeing with that too is like, uh, and regarding that, we show that black teens are most likely to say that they will join a pod. There's about 22%. Uh, whereas teens of other ethnicities, 10% white, 12% Hispanic, and 16% Asian teens um, are utilizing those pods. So you can see some um, discrepancies as far as access or availability to even things such as these pods or these online um, resources to expand their learning. You know, so. Those are some, some other things that come in mind when we talk about equity, um, is that digital access and not just even the access, but then there's also the digital literacy of the family members. And you know, when we're talking younger kids, especially, you know, our high school kids tend to be able to try to navigate through that. They're pretty, pretty savvy on, the, on um, devices, but when we're talking about four and five-year-olds in, in training, that, that means you have a parent that needs to be able to help them, and so you have some equity issues there as far as what family members are able to be home and stay home with the child um, because they're working jobs that are those essential jobs that they have to be out and working in. So those are some of the issues that we have noticed uh, coming up uh, as far as when we talk about equi inequities across the situation.
I'll go ahead um, and finish it off. So um, when it comes to the schools I'm working with, uh, the biggest thing is um, technology access. Um, many of the schools that um, we have in Southern Minnesota are ones that I worked with across the United States. Um, some of them do have a rollout for one-to-one -one devices that they've had, or they decided now we're going to get them and here they are. Um, internet, unfortunately, and many of the schools work with, they do not have a data plan. OPS is amazing that they were able to provide that. Um, but many of the ones that I work with, there is no plan for or idea of what that actually means. Um, I know and my home, our thing is we do not have um, necessarily an issue with internet itself. We actually got a new company, so thank God it's working so far. But um, it was the number of devices this last spring. So um, in my home, I was having my son use an iPad and my daughter was using a phone at one time. And then they would do a rock, paper, scissors to see who got it next and then they would flip for us to use. And doing a Zoom call with your teacher on a phone when you can't see all of your classmates creates huge anxiety, as you know, for especially elementary students and other students that want to be able to see their peers. Um, it became such a frustration with my students that they often did not want to go to even social meets with their um, peers because they said, why do it? I'm just going to see them and then you're going to take it away from me and I'm only going to see them on a little device. Um, I've also worked with schools across Kansas that had um, very different ways to deal with that inequality in a way when it comes to internet access. So one of the things they did was if you were in town, you had really good internet, you connected every day via Zoom. If you were on the hour laters, you got a video and you were able to YouTube things later on. And then there was the ones in the way far areas, the rural areas that did not have any internet access at all. They were sent a paper packet in the mail and said, here you go, try to figure out 10th grade chemistry. And one of my friends that I worked with said, I failed 10th grade chemistry when I was in 10th grade, I'm feeling it all over again. And I have so much anxiety, I don't even know what to do. Um, and also, the ways to communicate is something really hard, I feel like. I am so glad. Um, the big debate that I always have with all my um, parent friends is, what grade level would you want to have a kid in right now in COVID? Like, everyone's like, oh, I would love an elementary student. They're, they're easy, they're younger, they're one teacher. I'm that situation. And then I think, well, a high schooler, they're on their own. I can set them in a room. I don't have to be there physically and helping them out. And then someone's like, yeah, but do you know biology? And the communication is interesting. Um, when you're in high school, you work with seven different teachers throughout the day and all of their ways of communicating or how to get a hold of them or consistency of where to go to find that information is really hard compared to when you're in elementary and you just contact one teacher. So that's the biggest thing I've seen with the struggling of inequality in that. Also, a big thing that um, we're dealing with right now with all of our districts is camera on or camera off and what that means. Um, I encourage when I work with teachers that if you do have the t um, camera on, have your students give them the opportunity to have a virtual background. It blocks off access to their home. Um, you don't need to see that. They don't want you to see it either. Um, also, what you see could come into liability a lot. Um, also, the biggest question I get from teachers is then, well, what about they put up a virtual background I don't like? I'm like, well, this is your opportunity to say, here's a generic slide. Everyone gets the same background with the school mascot on it, or take it to the next level and have those students create their own graffiti gap background and represent who they are and express those. Um, as uh, a child that did not have a lot as a, or as a individual that did not have a lot as a child, I would have been extremely embarrassed to have my classmates see my child as, you know, my child at home. So I can't imagine having to do that now and have all of your classmates, let alone maybe one or two of your teachers all see that. So that's the biggest thing that we're seeing now is that constant, I need to see them, but I don't want them to turn off their camera. And that whole debate of that reaching into the home access that we're having issues with. So Oh, sorry, right. go, Melissa. I, was, I know we, we're both like, yes, yes, so good, so good. Well, go I was say that ties so nicely into, you know, the reason why digital citizenship is a really important piece and, and having um, some understanding of 
we're seeing in common sense cyberbullying occurring because people are making fun of students' backgrounds and stuff. And so having that um, cultural as well as, you know, literacy of, of students and their needs and, and kind of figuring out how to balance that with, okay, I want to be able to see you because I need to connect as, a, as your educator with you, but then also making sure you're making it so it's a safe environment for them in that online environment. And oftentimes we think safe environment when we're talking digital um, environments, we're, we're thinking about the bad guys out there that are surfing the web, you know, but we also need to think about what are we doing inside our classroom environments to set up so it's a safe environment inside the classroom, even in that digital classroom, so the other kids are supporting each other and respecting each other's boundaries is just kind of a real important piece to that. So, yeah. And, and we at, at Burke High School are picking up on that in a big way. In fact, we had our Communication Academy students, uh, they had a little competition as to who can design the virtual background for the school. So what you're seeing right behind me is the current submission that we're going to be using is, uh, as a default background for all of the students to use as a virtual background. So that's exact, exactly to what you guys are saying because that was a reality that we said, that's something we need to do. So we turned to our students and said, let's put it together. Which, and that's great because then you're pulling in on their creativity and that, that sort of thing. And, and I would say if those issues do come up in the classroom, it's just a really great teaching opportunity and a teaching moment to talk about that digital citizenship. It doesn't have to be digital citizenship, this other lesson that we do, it's just something that we're you know, integrating and modeling into our everyday environment on our classrooms in, in this way. Um, wonderful points. I, I honestly, I just hadn't even, that hadn't even crossed my mind um, because I'm not necessarily connecting with, with classes at home right now. Um, that, uh, that insecurity, I guess, that is just an added layer. Um, and it, you know, it ties ties into, again, a topic that, again, there's so much crossover between these topics we chose for uh, this whole week. And even last night, um, we were talking about um, a, a, one a member of the, an educator that was signed on asked about, you know, working with students, even we were kind of talking about COVID, that just they don't see the point um, in logging on virtually. And so it's, Again, it's just a, it's a whole other layer of possibilities, I guess, you have to consider about why students are feeling the way they are. So thank you all for that. Um, and I think that's, that will, uh, will be a good segue in talking about the innovation of that, like having students design a background. Um, what a wonderful uh, solution. I think that'll be a good segue into our final question. But before I, I ask that, um, and I do want to, we have just about 10 minutes left. So I think what I do, uh, would like to do, um, I'm going to copy and paste the uh, discussion questions um, that uh, we had talked about um, into the chat. And if uh, you, the educators participating, have something they would like to share, please feel free to respond to those in the chat. But also invite you, if you have a question for one or all of the panelists, um, you can put that in the chat um, at this time as well, and we'll uh, do our best to get to that. Um, but I don't want to miss this question because I, I, it's really easy with these topics that we chose to be a little bit doom and gloom, um, and I know it's really stressful right now. Um, but this, this last question um, for the panelists, as, as the museum, we've been asked by some funders and by um, just our partners to always be thinking about, you know, there's a lot of things we've had to adjust that maybe we cannot wait to adjust back to how it was pre-COVID. However, there's perhaps some things that this has forced us or allowed us to try that we think, oh, this is kind of a cool way to do it. And honestly, this entire week is an example of that. Um, we just got done having a, a budget meeting about 2021, and I said, we got to do teacher's week from now on. We're not going to go back to just having a teacher's night. And so um, I asked the panelists uh, to kind of uh, share something that they feel like is a positive that will uh, stick um, kind of that we've maybe had to adjust. Um, what do you see as a, as a positive, something we've learned that we think might continue even uh, uh, post, post pandemic, whatever that looks like? So I, I'm going to answer this question quickly because of time, but please also understand that I think this is maybe the question that we should 
could spend the most time on because I think it's the old 1950s factory model built by the Ford company of how we teach our kids is starting for the first time to crack and fade away. And I think there are some really amazing lessons to be learned from what's happening right now. I'm just going to say from my perspective really quick, as a curriculum specialist, I love the fact that when a teacher is not here, they can still teach from home. So what we do with substitutes has changed dramatically because we have some teachers that are that need to stay home for whatever reason, and it gives them the flexibility to be able to teach and learn in a different environment. I've got staff walking around with their phones outside, taking the kids on virtual field trips, showing all the kids the cool stuff that they can do. Um, like th those are potentials to access information that students, that teachers never would have even dreamed of because they would have said, I can't get my kids there. The second you realize that it's all possible in a virtual environment, we can give kids access if I really wanted to, I can get them, if I can find a way to do it in our Air and Space Academy, I got a camera on the ISS. I can have them talking directly to my kids here on Earth. And that's not even a thing that we thought could be possible. It's always been there at our fingertips. But because we haven't ex experienced this model, we never, we never were saying that's something that could happen. And now that we're getting more used to it and teachers are into it, having been forced, they're a little bit more comfortable. And now it's like, I mean, as... Uh, we want to bring in a pilot from Florida. Let's call him up and just bring him in Th and things like that, that never could have happened before. And our students now for the first time are starting to learn in an environment that works more like the real world, which I think is a really valuable piece. I'll say uh, from my perspective, I think there's like four, four things that uh, really are coming out of this one is relationships and um, the relationships that we have with our parents. So that school parent relationship um, is turning more into an integrated partnership more than ever before. And um, COVID has kind of pushed it into that. And I, I would love to see that that continues in a very different way, you know, because used to be the way it was, was just, you know, the parent was something we kind of told them about things. Now it's really how we work and operate together jointly. Um, the other piece is the digital literacy of our educators has grown exponentially <laughs> and um, after this, you know, it's kind of hard like, like um, Andrew was saying, going back to the previous model, this gives us and opens up for not just our teachers but also, also our students, which is my third point, is the ability for differentiation and, um, and then allowing that our students can have that voice and choice which is gonna make things so much more engaging for our students and making that learning become so much more meaningful to each and individual student. Um, and, learning. and then the fourth thing I think that this whole situation has put, not just as us in education, but just globally, is really just having um, a lens of looking at how we better balance our digital lives and just understanding that we need to practice that, you know, so that we can, um, because we're not going to we're not going to get rid of these computers or these phones. They're going to be here to stay. But how are we how are we managing them so they're not managing us and keeping that balance? So I think those are some of the takeaways that we'll have um, moving forward. So when I was thinking about this yesterday, I kind of broke it down into three areas, and the first two are kind of. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily the gloom and doom, but they are the awareness of what this pandemic has done. Um, the biggest thing is, I kind of looked in the two areas, is the hardship of people in a lower economic situation and what they have to go through, and also internet inequality. Once this is done with, and those devices are still kept in the classroom, are we going to continue to pay for data plans? Are we going to continue to find a way for those people to get connected? And I hope our, um, government as a whole looks at internet throughout the United States and how people are connected and how they are constantly need that to get, you know, to be able to do anything in this world because that's where we are. We are going to continue to, as Andrew said, be connecting this way. How many people now will probably never go back into the office because their office discovered that they don't need them physically in the building to do an amazing job. They can do that at home. Oh, the second thing is um, 
as I hope people are aware, and I know teachers already know this, you all know this, you all do an amazing job in what school actually provides for all of us. It provides an opportunity for students to have, um, you know, access to education absolutely for free, but also it provides childcare in many ways. With, without schools, those parents aren't able to go to jobs. I keep on thinking that if I didn't work at home, I would have to quit my job in order to be at home with my students or my children with them. Um, and also a social aspect for people to connect all the time like Melissa was bringing up over and over again. And also it's a safe environment for many students to go to every day. Um, and it's access to food, which is food scar scarcity is also becoming a bigger issue. So I hope it brings awareness though. But on a positive note, and Andrew took this away from me in many ways, we have been doing interactive virtual learning for 10, 15 years. When I worked at the Minnesota Historical Study over 10 years ago, we were connecting virtually to classrooms, physically. I hope people continue to say, I want to connect to that astronaut. I want to go to Australia and talk to someone and keep those going year after year after year after that and not say Zoom with that you know, shiver in the body later on. I wanted to say, hey, we can still do that. We don't have to leave those aspects behind and bring that back into the physical um, classroom, which is amazing that so many more people are kind of woken up to what you can do. I love that. I can't imagine the, the folks at CILC aren't sitting there going, we've had these things out here for years. <laughs> but I, I will add to that, I mean, we are, I consider myself really lucky in my position. Uh, the amount of sponsored programs that I'm able to promote and tell teachers, hey, you can participate in this at no cost to you or your school. I'm so lucky to be able to do that and to have the support of, of the rest of the museum and, and my team to fundraise and, and make that financially possible. Um, I guess my hope would be that um, we can, as, as cultural organizations, look at opportunities um, like that. It's not, it's not free for us to do that. It's not free for anybody to do that. You have to staff it and have supplies and technology. Um, but there are people in the Omaha community, foundations, um, and I'm sure all across the country that are seeing the value in um, being able to connect to us in our log cabin or our Native American Earth Lodge um, or with NASA because um, they've had a digital learning program uh, out there for many years. So that would be my hope is that um, we can just continue to be innovative and think about um, what we what we can offer you all to make your uh, your job more enriching and engaging as an educator. So um, I agree with Andrew. I wish we could definitely wish we could spend more time on that last part. I know all of you have been putting um, some resources in the chat and I'm, I'm super appreciative of that. Um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. So um, we will uh, uh, kind of wrap up here. Um, I, I super, super appreciate um, the panelists. Um, again, our, our planning committee, which was a whole separate group of people um, that uh, nominated these lovely panelists to be on <laughs> the panel, um, whether they knew about it or not. Um, and if you are comfortable doing so, um, we would absolutely love to see any of you on Friday evening. Um, we, we do have uh, safety in mind and are really looking forward to seeing some of you um, in person at a distance. It is a completely free event for educators. Tammy, I'm assuming you will not be making the five, six hour drive, but um, maybe some other time. <laughs> no, but I do love Omaha. It is an amazing <laughs> place. I love it. <laughs> Well, you'll have to come see us soon. Um, thank you again, everybody, um, and have a wonderful night.